So um, um, we'll start with uh, today's like introductory lung, uh, you know, kind of histopathology. We'll talk about histology, and then I'll cover the tumors today. And then we'll do the tumors for two lectures, two, two sessions today and, and the next time. And, um, uh, yeah, it's kind of... I just want to make sure it's... Uh, all, um Good. So, um, um, when it comes to uh, lung tumors and pathology, first you need to know your histology well, right? If you know your histology, then you know you know where the tumor is coming from, and what's how this tumor behaves, and so forth. Um, so uh, today's uh, and today and next time we'll cover the basic histopathology and also lung tumors. Uh, we'll cover basic anatomy, histology, risk factors, uh, clinical pathological characteristics. A little bit of molecular pathology. As you know, there's so much stuff coming out in molecular pathology when it comes to lung tumors and prognosis. I'll tie that, I'll tie that together. So uh, when you look at a lung, I don't have to show you these pictures. You've seen this many times. A trachea and a right and left stem, a men's stem bronchus. You know, when there's aspiration, it usually goes to the right side because of its aligns with the trachea. So it's more like, you know, uh, kind of uh, goes along with the trachea. So when there's aspiration in nursing home patients, so forth, you'll see patients aspirating on the right side and the left side. As you know, lungs have, uh, uh, you know, uh, 10 lobes, uh, uh, sorry, two lobes, uh, right and left lobes. Right has a middle lobe, left doesn't have a middle lobe. The upper lobe, uh, you know, on the, on the left side has such a lingula, right? So that kind of is almost like a middle lobe of the right lung. And the other thing is, look at the segments. There's, uh, you know, numbers uh, 1 through 10 in the segments, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. If you look on the left side, there is no uh, segment 7. See that? There's no 7. It's kind of fused with uh, 10. So uh, just to, you know, I don't know if it's important or not, but uh, something different. Uh, as you know, uh, lung uh, gets a supply from uh, the both... Uh, Pulmonary arteries, also from the bronchial arteries, right? There's dual supply. Sometimes, you know, patients can uh, survive the single supply. When you look at histology, when you are a fellow in, you know, in, in lung, in, in pulmonary fellows, I think slides are a fair game for you in your boards and so forth. So I think if you, you know, sit through my six sets of lectures, I think uh, histology-wise, you'll be fine. If they show you a slide, they're not going to go to slide and say, what is this? They'll give you a slide, they'll give you a clinical information and so forth and they'll come up with in diagnosis or management and so forth. But I think it'll help you out. I'll try to simplify a lot of things. When you look at a histology uh, of a lung, it looks very complex. It looks very like, you know, jagged areas. You don't know what's what. So let's uh, kind of simplify it. So the basic, uh, you know, for, the, for today's lecture, let's try to simplify, simplify things in the lung. As you know, uh, you know, there's a bronchus. And, uh, you know, you know this is a bronchus because of two things. First of all, there's a the cartilage, right? Bronchus has a cartilage, whereas, you know, bronchioles do not have a cartilage. And uh, I'll show you the respiratory-type epithelium that's lining in the, in the bronchus. Something, yes, the bronchus has that the bronchioles do not have are, the bronchus have a submucosal glands. Why do they have a submucosal glands? Because they produce a mucin, right? They produce, like, you no know, kind of, you know, uh, mucin so that they can uh, trap foreign objects and so forth. And there's a cilia in the lining here, trying to get rid of uh, these things. So there's a, there's a cartilage, which is, you know, the reason you have cartilage is because it's these large airways. It helps, you know, keep the airways open. That's why you have a cartilage. So um, that's it for the bronchus. And this is a high power view of the bronchial type mucosa. Anywhere from the upper respiratory tract all the way to the respiratory bronchioles, you have this kind of mucosa. Know the, know the key things here. See the cilia there? This is a lumen, okay? This is a lumen side. See that little fuzzy stuff? That's a cilia. The cilia kind of helps to get rid of the foreign stuff in their airways. So this is pseudostratified, pseudostratified columnar epithelium. These are not squamous epithelium, columnar epithelium, pseudostratified. These are the best membrane. See that? There's the best membrane, confined to the best membrane. What are these uh, cells? What are these called? Goblet cells. Goblet cells. Why do you have goblet cells? They produce mucin, mucin right? Can you, like in a certain kind of asthma and so forth, you can have a goblet cell hyperplasia, right? You have a lot of goblet cells. And you guys do an EBUS, right? You put a needle through the bronchus, right? So if you put a needle through the bronchus, what are the cells you're trying to see, <laughs> see first? You'll see these cells. So whenever I have an EBUS, you have, you know, these cells, you know, those are bronchoepithelial cells. You are, like, you know, grabbing some of those bronchoepithelial cells. You know, I can't call these malignant epithelial cells. These are like, even if you're going to the lymph node, 
you can see these cells, right? Epithelial cells. Sometimes I see there's a scatter epithelial cells, lymphocytes present, negative for malignancy. You may ask, how come there's epithelial cells in a EBUS in a lymph node? Well, because you're going through these airways. So whenever I see this respiratory, yeah, whenever I see this cilia, and there's a line right underneath the cilia. What's that called? See, there's a line right underneath the cilia. What's that called? That's called terminal bar, ter terminal bar. So when you see that terminal bar, a cilia, you know, you know, you know, uh, elongated cells like that, these are uh, bronchoepithelial cells. These are all benign cells. And again, in a certain condition, so when there's irritants around in the airways, you can have, uh, you know, a goblet cell hyperplasia. When I first started, you know, when I saw, you know, if I saw a lot of goblet cells sometimes, you know, you may be confused for uh, signaling ring cell carcinomas, right? Mucinous carcinomas. These cells look at signaling ring cells. If these are a lot of cells in the colon or breast, you can call mucinous carcinomas. Be careful not to call these, you know, mucinous carcinomas or signaling ring cell carcinomas. So what else is there that uh, the tumors arise from in these airways, in this lining? So the tumors arising from these glands are usually adenocarcinomas. What other cells are there that uh, gives rise to malignancy? What, what other tumors do you know besides adenocarcinoma? Non-small cell. Adenocarcinoma small is a part cell, of the non-small small cell. Small, small cell. cell. So where are the small cells coming from? What's the origin of small cells? Neuroendocrine cells. So where are the neuroendocrine cells? In the airways and the inner lining, airway linings. So, it's, so the neuroendocrine, there's normal neuroendocrine cells within these airways. If I were to do some neuroendocrine markers, some of these small cells can stand for neuroendocrine markers. All right. So just note that the neuroendocrine cells are normally found in the airways of the lung. So, you know, so these are where you get a you know not only small cell, large cell neuroendocrine tumors, atypical carcinoid, carcinoid, neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia, right? Diffuse neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia. They all arise from these areas. Any questions? So this is a low bar view. See, this is uh, the pleura is very thin, right? The pleura is very thin. We talk about malignant mesothelioma, right? It's a big topic in, in lung pathology, malignant mesothelioma. But if you look at it, there's not a whole lot of mesothelial cells there. It's, the pleura is very, uh, you know, kind of very thin uh, lining. This is a, these are the visceral pleura, right? They line the organs. There's a visceral pleura. The pleura that's against the wall is a parietal pleura. Why do you need to know this? Because if I have an adenocarcinoma here and it involves a pleura, what's the stage? What's the T classification? T4. T4, yeah. T4A, right? So if it involves the pleura, it's a T4A. If I have a one centimeter adenocarcinoma involving the pleura, that's T4A. If I have a three centimeter tumor, if I have a 2.8 centimeter tumor right here, what's the stage? What's the T? T1. It's not involved, yeah. Yeah, it's a T1, right? So you can have a, you know, almost a three centimeter tumor not involving the pleura, it's a T1. Right? But if you have a malignant pleural fluid, that's even worse, right? If you have a pleural fluid that's malignant, cytology. It, it, yeah, exactly. That's even worse. So another, another situation. You have ad adenocarcinoma. It's a three centimeters. It's, it does not involve the pleura. And what's the management? You can do surgery. Surgery, surgery, right? It's like lobectomy, right? You do lobectomy. What are the chances this patient will have normal lifespan? About 90%. Yeah, this patient will do very well. So that's 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 the importance of whether the pleura is involved or not, or whether pleural fluid there's tumor in the pleural fluid or not. That's that's really important. So that's why new classifications with uh, adenocarcinoma in situ. We didn't have adenocarcinoma in situ ten years ago, right? Did you have adenocarcinoma in situ be ten years ago in a lung? No. What is that called? Bronchial that is a bronchial alveolar carcinoma. That that was the diagnosis uh, ten years ago. If you look at an uh, older textbook, they call it bronchiolo alveolar carcinoma. Dr. Kawaza and all those people still use that term, right? Bron bronchiolo alveolar carcinoma. So the new term is adenocarcinoma in situ. What's a minimally invasive adenocarcinoma? What's, a, what's the criteria? How do you make a diagnosis of minimally invasive adenocarcinoma? Five millimeters. Less than five millimeters invasion is minimally invasive adenocarcinomas. So both adenocarcinoma in situ and minimally invasive adenocarcinomas, when you resect it, these have excellent survival, almost, nor almost normal lifespan. That's why this classification was put up forth by many experts about you know ten years ago. All right. So um, so the pleura uh, we talk about you know tumor involved in the pleura. So the the tumor arising of the pleura is called what? What what's there in the pleura? What kind of cells do you find in the pleura? So tumors. Mesothelial cells, cells, right? Mesothelial cells line the pleura. So tumors arising from mesothelial cells called mesothelioma. 
right? Some of the older books talk about binan mizatilioma. In your practice, there is no binan mizatilioma. Yeah. You know, if you have mizatilioma, I call it malignant mizatilioma. Some of the older books talk about like binan mizatilioma. Those are totally different entities. I thought in the eighth edition of the cancer involved, like the pleura is T3, is that right? Not T4. T2. Yeah. If it is with pleura, it's a T2. If T2. it involves a pleura. Okay. If it is like, uh, you know, uh, if it is less than three centimeters and involves a pleura, it's a T2 lesion. So, and also there's a septa. Why is this important? Why is the septa important? I'll show you in a bit, okay? So you can see uh, terminal bronchioles, structural bronchioles, you know, alveolar duct and, uh, and alveoli. So the other things in the lung is when you see an artery, if you're looking for a bronchial, the artery and the bronchioles go together. They go in a bundle. The veins are not there. You don't see veins there. You see artery and bronchial. How do I know this is the artery? Because the walls are thick. If I were to do elastin stain, there'd be two layers of elastin stain in the artery. So if you're looking for a bronchial or the artery, they go in a bundle. So if you see one, you'll see the other one. You can see it's a thick wall. There's, you know, this is longitudinal, the circumferential, so there's a elastin there, elastin there. The veins actually go by the septa. See the septa I showed you earlier? So these are the veins there. So that's where you find the veins. When you're studying interstitial lung disease, these things are important. As you can see, the wall is very thin. Yeah. It's a mix on the pleura, because uh, they mentioned that twice here, parietal pleura, they call it T3, but then when you... It's a visceral go, pleura, is too. When you, go, good, yeah. when you go again, and they mentioned it at, uh, M, uh, at metastatic 1, T4. Yeah, but like so he, like it's I think mentioned the twice. Is T3. So uh, this is uh, the mesothelial cells, as you can see, very sparse, very few. This one, this one. So there's uh, just a sparse, they cannot spread out. So when you have a tumor arising you know, from, uh, you know, from mesothelial cells, it's called mesothelioma, malignant mesothelioma. So talking about the mesothelial cells and cytosis. When you look at plural food for cytosis, you see mesothelial cells all the time, right? All the time, especially if there's irritation, you see a lot of mesothelial cells in cytology. Just because you see mesothelial cells in cytology doesn't mean it's malignant mesothelioma, all right? There's a couple of caveats. I, we should never make a diagnosis of malignant mesothelioma in cytology. <laughs> Book show pictures, you should never make it. The main reason is you can have a really reactive mesothelial cells. They look very ugly in the pleural fluid and in the, that looks like a mesothelioma, but those could be reactive. You can have a very bland mesothelial cells in pleural fluid and those could be, you know, coming from a malign you know, malignant mesothelioma. Yeah. So for the diagnosis of malignant mesothelioma, what do you need? You need a biopsy. You need a tissue, <coughs> right? You need tissue invasion. You need this in proliferation of mesothelial cells going into the tissue that makes it a uh, malignant mesothelioma. It has to invade, all right? You have a mass effect and invade to call malignant mesothelioma. So if you call me and say, Dr. Sigdal, is this a malignant mesothelioma and cytology? I say, I don't know. Right, that'll be atypical mesothelial cells or correlate or biopsy recommended if you're thinking malignant mesothelioma. The elastins are right there. Those are, those are the elastins. So for the tumor to call it like pleural invasion, it has to involve the elastin. If the tumor comes up to there, that's not a pleural invasion. This is still, you know, doing this for size criteria. So look at this. And I'm not, this will kind of simplify everything on your lung saucy. So there's a little vessel there, okay? There's a little vessel there. And this is probably a vessel there. Why is this a vessel? These are RBCs, okay? There's RBCs all around, but this is a lumen, all right? The cells that line this uh, vessel is called what? Endothelial cells, right? Endothelial cells, right? The cells that line the vessels are called endothelial cells. The cells that line this septa are called epithelial cells or pneumocytes. Epithelial cells or pneumocytes. So there's two types of pneumocytes, right? Type 1 pneumocyte, which is more flat covers about 95% of their surface in the airways. Uh, mainly because these this have a flat, it covers long areas, big areas. So this is called type 1 pneumocytes. Type 2 pneumocytes are keyboidal, like a rounder looking, like you look at hobnail kind of protruding. That's type 2 pneumocytes. So type 2 pneumocytes produce surfactant, right? This produce surfactant. You can see this is kind of expanded lung, right? This airspace expanded. So you have type 1 pneumocytes, type 2 pneumocytes, endothelial cells, some blood, and you know, what else is there? There's, what are these? What do you think these are? Macrophages. 
Good, because they're not attached to any of those structures there, right? They're just floating in the airways, right? They're, they're in airspace. These are macrophases. When do you see a lot of macrophases? Smokers, smokers. right? We hear about smokers' macrophages? <laughs> they have dust, you know, they have like a fine dust in their uh, macrophages, smokers' macrophages. We know conditions with uh, proliferation macrophages, right? Benign conditions, right? If, right? Do we know any conditions where there's a lot of macrophages within the airways? Diffuse or Yeah. Or hammers? Okay. You can have hammers, but what, what are the other conditions? RBILDs, right? Uh, Discommitting medicinal pneumonia, right? You see a lot of uh, macrophages in, in. So how do you this, uh, treat these patients? Stop smoking, right? That's how you treat the patients. Stop smoking. Mm -hmm. So that's so that's kind of what you see. That's you can pretty much know everything what's there now. You know endothelial cells, epithelial or pneumocytes. Uh, there's uh, macrophages. That's what it is, and uh, you may see you know other things. So what's the interstitial lung disease? Interstitial lung disease is expansion of the interstitium. Expansion of the interstitium. There's the you know, um, uh, fibroblast, a myofibroblast, uh, glycogens and so forth, uh, inflammations, so those are all related to interstitial lung disease, right? So it's the same thing, endothelial cells, epithelial cells, type two epithelial cells are type two pneumocytes, and type one epithelial cells are type one pneumocytes, and anything in between are interstitial cells. So, uh, as you know, this is a kind of older data, but it's, it's, the, the, the numbers are very similar. So, number one, uh, there's about, you know, close to 3 million people uh, died in the U.S. Uh, in 2015. And heart disease is uh, still number one, right, killer? Cardiovascular disease, number one killer. Number two killer is malignant neoplasma, or cancers, right? So, what cancer kills the most among all the cancers? Lung cancers, what percent? What percent of the cancers are related to lung cancers, deaths-wise? Close to 29, 30 percent. So almost one-third, almost like 30 percent of cancer-related deaths are due to lung cancers. That's why you see it all the time, you know, you know, in a lung pathology, you know, lung tumors are very common. They're very common. Last year, like, I think COVID is like, you know, almost had a number two, right? Number two cause of deaths, like 600 people. Mm -hmm. like, maybe number one, too, so... Um, so lung tumors, uh, most common cause of cancer mortality worldwide, largely due to cigarette smoking. Uh, when it comes to small cell carcinoma, what percent of people are sm uh, smokers? Small cell? Almost all of them. Mm -hmm. When it comes to squamous cell carcinoma, what percent of your patients are smokers? 75. 100%, close to 100% squamous cell carcinoma. Oh, squamous cell carcinoma. How about adenic carcinomas? How do you know? Yeah, about 75%. 75. So there's about 25% non-smokers with adenic carcinoma. So if, I saw, so if you have a cancer, a lung cancer, and a patient who's not a smoker, and doesn't actually smoke, you think okay. adenic carcinomas, right? Then EGFRs and those things are important. Uh, what's the other tumor that it's, it's seen non-smokers? What other tumor do you see in non-smokers? Carcinoid. Carcinoid. 40% of uh, carcinoid tumors are non-smokers. You know, so uh, in a carcinoid tumors... Let's talk about neuroendocrine tumors. Neuroendocrine tumor is a spectrum, right? It's a spectrum. Yeah. Now, in the low spectrum, Carcin which is not a carcin carcinoma yet, is called a hyperplasia, right? Mm -hmm. Neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia, a diffuse uh, you know, just hyperplasia. Then there's a, what's this criteria? Five millimeters. If it is more than five millimeters, it's a carcinoid, right? How do you tell a carcinoid from a typical carcinoid from a small cell? How do you tell the difference? How do you tell a carcinoid? From atypical carcinoid. Uh, rate of progression and the mitosis. Necrosis and mitosis. Mitosis is a key. Mitosis, less than two mitotic figures per 10 high power. If I look at 10 sites in a high power, if I see less than two mitosis, that's a carcinoid. If I see two to 10 mitosis per 10 high power field, that's atypical carcinoid. And anything more than 10 mitosis per 10 high power field, that's a small cell. So if I look at any field, if I see mitotic figures, that's a small cell. And the smoking history? Well, that's clinical information for diagnosing-wise. Yeah. And necrosis, like small cell has a lot of necrosis, right? Mm -hmm. Atypical carcinoid may may not have necrosis. Large cell neurogen tumor also behaves like a small cell, right? Has a lot of mitotic figures, a lot of necrosis, but cells are large. Yeah. The large cell neurogen tumors are classified non under non-small non cell carcinoma. So don't confuse, you know, those are board of questions, they can ask you those kind of things. So, uh, you know, quite a bit of uh, smoking related deaths in the U.S. Uh, from uh, lung cancers. So number one cancer in a male by incidence wise, 
Uh, number one cancer in a male is a prostate, right? 27%. If you want to have a cancer, prostate cancer is the one to have because, you know, patients actually do pretty well. Female, very easy, breast, number one. Number two, uh, lung, 14. Number two, 13, uh, lung. So by uh, that's incidence-wise. You exclude skin cancers. Cancer-related deaths, number one uh, in the male is a, is a lung, 28%. Female is 26% lung. The breast is behind, number two. And then prostate is, uh, is number two again. And then uh, GI is, is, is pretty high there too. Uh, this is going to older graph, but again, see, uh, uh, you know, the smoking, uh, you know, uh, yeah. mortality, lung, bronch, both sexes, like, you know, kind of uh, peaked in uh, 1990s, actually slightly declining, but you can see this West Virginia line is not declining as fast. What percent of people smoked in 60s, 1960s? What percent of U.S. population smoked 60s? All of them. All of them? <laughs> Actually, not true. Maybe about 30%. Oh. Okay, so what percent of the people, U.S. population still smoke now? What's your experience? 18 percent, 17 percent, right? Uh, so we talk about how if you diagnose a uh, carcinoma when the tumor is small, resected patient, patients will have normal lifespan. So what are the chances that the person today diagnosed with lung cancer will live five years? The still, still dismal because by the time they pay, come to you, a lot of times it's spread to other places, right? So adenocarcinoma, or non-small cells, 50% chance have spread to other areas. Small cell carcinoma, 80% chance have spread to other areas. That's why, you know, the outcome is still pretty bad, dismal, despite all this molecular testing and everything, you know, still in you know, a lot of people die of lung cancers. You can see, you know, the importance of uh, cigarette smoking and and uh, and uh, lung cancer. So uh, in today's world, you know, medical students and so forth, residents, fellows, uh, none of none of us should be smoking. Period. You know, that's 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, even 70s, even 80s. They smoked in the Congress. They smoked in the movie theater. They smoked in the hospitals. And and now nobody should be. This is a national park, you know, and we're going to uh, one of the national parks out west, and this is what I see. So they're hiking and biking and all that, and they're also smoking. <laughs> so so much for healthcare stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it depends how much you smoke, and how much you inhale, and how long you smoked, right? I don't have to tell you this. A number of back back years, uh, packs that smoked uh, per day times number of years. So if you smoke half a pack a day for 20 years, then that's a 10 year pack year, right? Uh, uranium uh, asbestos, we'll talk about asbestos. Uh, the, key, the question that I ask you about asbestos, a couple of questions they can ask you in the board, tricky questions. First of all, uh, straight out the thing, if you are exposed to asbestos, a non-smoker, there's five times more risk of getting cancers, lung cancers, uh, progesterone carcinomas. But if you smoke and are ex exposed to asbestos, it's a synergistic, almost 100% times more risk of getting lung cancers. So as you know, people in mines and stuff like that, they also smoke. Right, you know, just uh, the way they do it. So it's a synergistic. So asbestos and cigarette smoking uh, can, uh, you know, uh, really increase the risk for lung cancers. So what's the number one cancer associated with asbestos? What what tumor? Trick question. What's a number one tumor associated with asbestos? What's a what? In the last kind of boards, this is guaranteed. The last kind of boards. What cancer do you see the most when yeah, asbestos? It was in my board last year. Yeah, so what's, what's the number one tumor cancer associated with asbestos? Mesothelium? No. <laughs> That's a trick question right That's there. That's what they want you to say. <laughs> Lung cancer. But yeah, bronchogenic carcinoma. Yeah. That's it, because you see more of those. Okay? That's, 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 a, that's a trick question. Another trick question is, they'll give you a history of smoking and say, uh, uh, what does this cause, and blah, 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 whatever, you know. It's lung cancers and, and uh, mesothelioma. So, so is there a relationship between smoking and mesothelioma? There's no. But there's, there's no studies to relate to smoking and mesotheliomas. Mm -hmm. We think of people smokers who also have mesothelioma. Just that can be a trick question, so they can put, mix it up. And so just be careful not to smoking kind of... Smoking the asbestos. Yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah, they have synergistic by smoking alone. Uh, you know, mesothelioma, there's there's no proven relationship, so don't pick that answer. Pick bronchogenic carcinoma, or bladder cancers, or, you know, those kind of cancers, okay? Renal cancers, so smoking-related. So these are all trick questions. They even ask you, you know, probably to the board, they even ask you what type of non-smoking carcinoma, or bronchogenic carcinoma do you see with, 
uh, you know, uh, asbestos. And that's like, you know, that's, that's, that's a tough question. That's not a fair question. But if they ask you, like, number one, uh, malignancy associated with asbestos is a problem with any carcinoma. You also are, you know, they talk about, you know, air pollution and so forth. Um, again, uh, non-smokers, lung cancers, 25% uh, of lung cancers are non-smokers, usually females and adenocarcinomas, and these patients usually have EZFR mutations. They usually give Asian female, like, you know, from Japan or Southeast Asia or so forth, and say it's female, you know, non-smoker, and, and they might say it has a lung cancer, uh, what kind of molecular testing you want to do, or this kind of things. You know, they'll, they'll kind of, you know, uh, tarzan, you know, uh, the tarzan kind of inhibitors, so, so, so forth and so forth. What do you treat it with for fellows, you know? So, so, uh, you know, Tarshiva, those kind of things. Uh, those are the kind of things they put it together. So know that non-smokers you're seeing in adenocarcinomas. Uh, in a carcinoid tumors can also be seen patients with non-smoking history. And uh, mutations are also key. So this is important before we get to the uh, next uh, set of lectures. Uh, the precursor lesions, squamous dysplasia. Do we see squamous cells in the lung and the histology? Did, we see, did, did I show you squamous cells? No, right? The normal lung doesn't have squamous cells, right? Doesn't have any squamous lining in the lung. So where do you get a small squamous cell carcinoma? I'm sorry? Vocal cord. Vocal cord. Again, I made a study, but that's a tumor of the vocal cords. But how could you get a small cell? Because the smoke and metaplasia. Metaplasia. The normal ciliated columnar epithelium is replaced by squamous epithelium. So that's metaplasia. That's metaplasia. One type of a benign, you know, lining is replaced by another type of benign lining. That's metaplastic cells, right? Squamous uh, metaplasia. You can see, you know, squamous metaplasia in the lung quite often. In especially in, a, you know, like a female 70s and 80s, I see a lot of squamous metaplasia. There are entities in the lung disease we see squamous metaplasia. So the normal ciliated columnar epithelium is replaced by a squamous epithelium, and the squamous epithelium will have dysplasia. All right, with a little bit of dysplasia or a lot of dysplasia. When there's a little bit of dysplasia, we say mild dysplasia. When there's a lot, little bit more dysplasia, we say moderate dysplasia. When there's a lot of dysplasia, we say carcinoma in situ or severe dysplasia. Okay, that's carcinoma in situ. So this can give rise to squamous cell carcinoma in the lung, right? It can rise to squamous cell carcinoma. Do you see squamous cell carcinoma in the periphery or in the center area? Center, center area, right? Do you see necrosis more with squamous cell or adenocarcinomas? Squamous cell carcinomas. When you have a malignant pleural fluid, do you see squamous cell carcinoma more or adenocarcinomas? Adenocarcinoma. You hardly see any squamous cell carcinoma in a pleural fluid. You're following a patient. These are all practical, you know, we see it all the time. You're following a patient, patient can, comes in for uh, like a heavy smoker, comes in for a CT scan just for, you know, uh, and then there's like a, say, you know, 0.8 centimeter nodule. You're following and following and following. And two years, three years later, it grows by two millimeters. What kind of tumor is that? Slow growth. Adenocarcinoma. It's adenocarcinoma, you know. A uh, patient comes with ataxia or hard to talk and stuff. He can't walk or stuff like that. And they do a CT scan of the head. They see a tumor, all right? Small cell. Small. small cell or adenocarcinoma more common too, right? Adenocarcinoma, I've seen adenocarcinoma of the lung primary to the brain before the diagnosis of lung cancer. Oh. When you diagnose a small cell carcinoma, patients are usually pretty bad, right? If you, you see like, you know, do you see small cell carcinoma in the periphery or in the center? Center, you see large masses, you see lymph node metastases, right? You see, so you can sometimes have paraneoplastic syndromes, right? So there's Cushionoid syndromes, uh, there's uh, hypercalcemia in a pain, you know, it's carcinoma and so forth. So, know the paraneoplastic syndrome, those are again another good word question so for your boards and so forth. So, how do you define an atypical adenomatous hyperplasia? How do you define that? Like, what's that? This is kind of precursor lesion for adenocarcinoma, all right? These are precursor lesions for adenocarcinoma. How do I know whether it's adenocarcinoma in situ versus the atypical adenomatous hyperplasia? Diameter. Size. What's the size? Uh, less than five millimeters. Five millimeters is very key in the patholog pathology. There are three things five millimeters. I always remember. One is atypical adenomatous hyperplasia versus adenocarcinoma in situ. More than five millimeters is adenocarcinoma in situ. Less than five millimeters, it's a AAH. Okay, it's it's a benign. 
The other area where five millimeters is important is uh, neuroequine cell hyperplasia. Yeah. It's more than five millimeters, you call carcinoid. Less than five millimeters, you talk call... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So there's one more area, if you I come... You, you call it what if it's less than five millimeters? You call uh, hyperplasia. It dip, uh, for if it is... In a, it, um, you uh, call it carcinoid. You, you call it what? If it's four, if more than five, you call it carcinoid. Carcinoid. Less than that, it's like a neurological hyperplasia. Okay. All right? It's, it's hyperplasia. So it's, it's benign versus malignant. So it's a business based on size. And what's the third one? Third, there's one more thing. I'll, I'll remember it. I'll, I'll come back to you. And that the invasion, the five millimeter invasion. Like more than five millimeter invasion, it's an invasive carcinoma. Less than five millimeter invasion is a minimally invasive. So there's like a five millimeter criteria. So these are all, you know, war question kind of things. So precursor lesions may or may not lead to cancer, okay? So neuroequine cell hyperplasia, uh, proliferation of benign neuroequine cells. I told you where the neuroequine cells are found. So let's look at this slide. This, has a, this is, you know, this is not a, in a columnar epithelium, right? This is squamous epithelium. So uh, I'll show you, uh, when I show you a uh, squamous cell carcinoma, so I'll show you a uh, slide. How do I know this is a squamous epithelium? Sometimes you can have a keratin, right? Keratin is seen more squamous epithelium. And sometimes between the cells, there are bridges. What are those called? Desmosomes, all right? This is, you know, cell cell atasm, desmosomes. You see the desmosomes in squamous cell carcinomas. So this is a very ugly looking cells, goes all the way to the tippy top, this full thickness dysplasia, you can call it severe dysplasia or carcinoma in situ. Why is this not an invasive carcinoma? Why is this not an invasive carcinoma? The basement memory is intact. Yeah, so there's no invasion into the soft tissue underneath it. All right? So you can see goblet cells, hyperplasia, a lot of goblet cells, cilia. Whenever I see a cilia, I back off. All right? There are conditions where there's, uh, you know, uh, bronchiolar metaplasia in the lung. Even in the periphery, you see a lot of bronchiolar cells. And uh, this is like, you know, you're, I don't think you'll ever hear this term, but it's called lambertosis. If you use this term, uh, you know, in front of your attending stuff like that, you may sound very smart. For lambertosis is nothing but uh, bronchiolar metaplasia in the periphery of the lung. There are interstitial lung diseases. It's called lambertosis. So this is a, a goblet cells hyperplasia, you know, like in irritants, like in asthmas and so forth, you can see that. Uh, this is kind of basal cell, nobody will ever ask you this, kind of a basal looking cells kind of going up there. But this dysplastic, look at this, this, these are looking ugly now, it's like darker, irregular chromatin and so forth. One third, this is mild dysplasia, this mild dysplasia, the surface is fine. This is a dysplasia again, dysplasia, uh, uh, maybe a little bit normal on the top. But this is like full thickness dysplasia carcinoma in situ. And the displays is up here, and this slide displays up here, but there's a tumor underneath, so this invasive carcinoma. So that's the thing for squamous cell carcinoma in situ or dysplastic epithelium in a squamous cell. Sometimes the thoracic surgeons will give me a, a, a lobectomy specimen to evaluate for bronchial margin, right? Whether bronchial margin is involved by the tumor or not. And sometimes there's a little bit of dysplasia, so I don't want to alarm him. I just say, you know, bronchial margin is negative, negative for malignancy. Remember, I showed you normal slides of the lung earlier, kind of thin, you know, uh, alveolar septa like that. Uh, so that's 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 what the thickness. It's like paper thin of the alveolar, right? You know, septa right there. There's a little holes between these septa sometimes. What are those called? Like if you answer this, you're like superb. You know, you know all your lung pathology or histology. So it's called pores of cone pores of KOH and cone. Sometimes the tumors can you know, pass from one area to other. What kind of tumors can you see where the tumors pass from one airspace to other? Is that the lymphangetic? That's, that's, that's more, uh, that's from the lymphatics, but this is, in this one you see mucinous, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, lipidic growth pattern. There's tumors with lipidic growth patterns, like your so-called branchola alveolar type. There's a mucinous type that can spread from one area to the other from these uh, little holes. And the those are thing in like in clinical for these pores of cones, like you, you and you have a pneumothorax patient usually like if you use a valve to block that area, it's still like will continue to inflate and that's when there is like a lot of connection between the healthy alveoli and that bad alveoli with the re regular anatomical uh, holes. So um, so that's a normal part right here in the corner there. This is abnormal. Why is this abnormal? 
there's two things going on. First of all, it's thickened, right? Is it this, you know, areas kind of thickened, uh, septa is thickened, and the cells lining these are kind of, I'll show you another picture. The cells are like cuboidal, more, you don't see many cells here. There you can see a lot of cells lining this. Okay, a lot of cells lining this. So this is atypical adenomatous hyperplasia. So what's the size criteria for this diagnosis? Five millimeters, right? Less than five millimeters, you see this kind of structures, it's called atypical adenomatous hyperplasia. These are precancerous lesions, all right? Precancerous, these are not malignant lesions. If you see this figure, it's more than five millimeters, what's the diagnosis? Adenocarcinoma in situ. Adenocarcinoma in situ, right? And if it's in it's the basement membrane, then it's locally invasive. Yeah, in the basement membrane, you usually see, yeah, there's a local invasion, five millimeters, right? More than, if it's more than five millimeters, then it's invasive, frankly invasive. So, long tumors are classifications, so long tumors classifications. As you know, this is, I don't have to tell, this small cell versus non-small cell. Is there subclassification under small cell? Is there subtype of small cell carcinoma? No, not really. Unless there's a mixed type, you know? Yeah. Sometimes you can see uh, any carcinoma as a small, small cell. Not too often, but once in a while you'll see mixed tumors. So that's the only time. Other than that, small cell is a small cell. Where is the origin of this cell, uh, tumors? Where does these tumors arise from? Neuroendocrine Neuro cells. These are high-grade tumors, right? High-grade tumors. How often have you seen a small cell carcinoma patient survive 10 years? Not too often. Mm -hmm. The number is about 15% five years. So if I make a diagnosis of small cell carcinoma, first of all, make sure this patient is a smoker. Almost 100% are smokers. Second of all, uh, you know, make sure, uh, not make sure, but you know, you don't expect this patient to live very long. Five years survive is about 10 to 15 percent. So, you know, oncologists are pretty aware of this. non cell carcinoma, the main ones are squamous cell carcinomas, adenine carcinomas, large cell carcinomas. Large cell carcinomas usually don't make the diagnosis anymore because we try to differentiate between small cell, ver ver sorry, squamous cell versus adenine carcinomas. Uh, please note that large cell neurogen tumors are also kept classified under non-small cell carcinomas, all right? Uh, so those also fall under that category, although BF's like a small cell. You can have a sarcomatoid carcinoma, carcinoma that looks like a sarcoma. You can have a carcinoma that looks like a salivary gland tumors. There's rare, there's, you know, you name it, you know, you, you see quite a, quite a few rare ones. So uh, you know this pretty well. Small cell carcinomas are almost almost metastatic at the time of diagnosis. They they initially respond to chemo. They are 100% smoking related. Uh, these patients are not surgical candidates. So if I'm doing a frozen section and that a charge sends me a wedge biopsy, and I you know if I tell him small cell carcinoma, what does he do? He stops. He closes. I'm done. Right? If I tell him you know it's adenine carcinoma or non small cell carcinoma, what does he do? He takes a low bar. Right? If there's no other tumors, other places, lymph nodes, stuff like that, it takes a whole lobe out. Yeah. Yeah, why does he take a lobe out? He wants to get all tumor out. So when he gives a lobe out, he asks me to do a bronchial margin for a frozen section, make sure bronchial margin is negative. If I tell him the bronchial margin is positive, what does he do? Pneumonectomy, right? He can either take a little bit more bronchus if there's any. Usually he can, so he has to take whole side of the lung. So, you know, that's where stress is. You know, I got to give him an accurate diagnosis. If there's a cancer, I tell him I don't see a cancer, he puts it back up, and then the final diagnosis, I tell him it's a cancer, he's gonna go back and dig it out, you know, he's not gonna be happy, you know, so there's a fine line not to overcall it and undercall it. So non small cell carcinoma, 50% of the time, the metastatic at the time of diagnosis, less response given, but these patients are usually surgical candidates. So non small cell carcinomas, squamous cell carcinomas, uh, adenine carcinomas, large cell carcinomas, uh, adenosquamous carcinoma, carcinoma with sarcomatoid elements, carcinoid tumors, carcinoma of the cyber gland type, and unclassified. So these are all, we'll talk about many of these tumors. How, how, how often do you use the uh, adenocarcinoma, uh, carcinomatoid changes? Like the, if you go back, for the carcinoma with sarcom sarcomatoid? Uh, you, don't, you don't use it too often. Uh, whenever I have that, this kind of tumor, what happens is something they call uh, carcinosarcoma. You've heard that, or yes. uh, you know, carcinosarcoma or sarcomatoid carcinomas. Either way, uh, usually I don't use this term. Uh, I usually see poor different carcinoma, but if I see both carcinoma elements and sarcoma elements, then, then yeah, I use this term, you know, and then I can yeah. do stain it for sarcoma markers. I can stain it for carcinoma markers, uh, and these are really aggressive tumors, right? And I've never seen it in real life. Yeah, well, I've I've seen a few uh, in the practice here, 15 years. Um, adenosquamous carcinoma, I've seen quite more often. 
with both adeno components there and squamous component there, right? right? Yes. So yes. That, that tumor is more often, I, I make the diagnosis. And um, this tumor, adenosquamous carcinoma, actually behaves much worse than either adeno or squamous. There's actually more aggressive tumors. With these tumors, again, for example, I, I can diagnose adenosquamous carcinoma of the lung. You may see either squamous element in the brain or adenocarcinoma in the brain. So, you know, one of these components can metastasize to other areas. Uh, we'll just maybe just cover uh, squamous carcinoma today and we'll finish up the rest next time. So squamous carcinoma is commonly in Maine, Western world, smoking in, 100% are smokers. Uh, usually the pleural effusion do not have these squamous carcinomas. These are usually centrally located, again, on the hyalur area. And uh, peripheral location is, is under eyes, but usually, you know, these patients can produce hypercalcemia due to parathyroid uh, hormone-related proteins. Uh, these uh, squamous carcinomas can have a higher incidence of P53 mutations. There are subtypes of squamous carcinomas, all right? There's a papillary carcinomas, there's a sclerosal cell carcinomas, there's a small cell carcinomas, there's basaloid carcinomas. Basaloid carcinomas are seen more head and neck areas. If I see basaloid squamous cell carcinoma in the lung, and if make sure the patient doesn't have any head and neck uh, basaloid carcinomas. Uh, just just to FYI, since you guys are fellows and you know you're specializing in the lung, uh, some people may diagnose a small cell variant of squamous cell carcinoma. So these are squamous cell carcinoma. These are not small cells. Subtype. Subtype. So I usually don't try to make that uh, distinction because I don't want to confuse people. I don't want somebody to read a report and say, oh, this is a small cell. It's, it's not a small cell. It's a squamous cell. So it's a small cell variant of, uh, you know, squamous cell. So these are the, some of the subtypes of squamous cell. These are under the squamous cell carcinoma. Well differentiator, I told you earlier, you should keratinize this in squamous pearls. These are classic questions. You know, they, they can show you a histology with keratin pearls. You see like pink stuff with whorls in the center of the tumor. Think of squamous cell carcinoma. You know, you don't have to, you know, you know, you, you have a diagnosis right there. They're not going to ask you what's the diagnosis. They'll ask you the management, right? They, you know, what are the outcomes of the patients? And that's what they'll ask you for clinicians. It's, you know, like for HML1, yeah, they can ask you what's the diagnosis. Intercellular breathing is, is key, another key where you can stain. Sorry, in this uh, well differentiated squamous cell carcinoma, you see keratinization, you see intercellular breathing, I don't do stain. That's my squamous cell carcinoma diagnosis. In a poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma, the intercellular breathing and keratinization may not be seen, which actually you don't see. Them. So uh, what you do is you do immunohistochemical stains. We do stains, ISC stains. You see pathology works with all the different stains. If you want to take a home message, if you want to remember P63 and P40, which is not included here, P63 is a good squamous cell marker. So it can stain any other squamous cells, whether it's the cervical squamous cells, the neck squamous cells, skin squamous cells, lung squamous cells. So sometimes you ask me, where is this squamous cell coming from? I just can't tell you. If you have a squamous cell carcinoma in the brain, I really can't tell you whether this is coming from the you know, esophagus or from the larynx or from the lung or from the you know, cervix and so forth. There's one stain may be helpful, P16, is like related to HPV, right? A lot of cervical cancers, uh, head and can, can, neck cancers can be HPV positive. So P16 can be positive in patients with HPV related to squamous carcinoma. But as you know, there's studies in the books where lung cancers can be, squamous cell carcinoma can be P16 positive, right? So it just kind of helps the oncologists kind of see whether this is, they can kind of follow up, yeah. And unfortunately, like, you need to memorize these stains because it's in the board. Yeah, it's going to be in the boards. I'll tell you, squamous cell carcinoma, P63. Lung uh, carcinomas, I'll give you a marker. For neurogen markers, I'll give you things. You don't have to memorize 100 stains. No one or two stains. If you know these stains before the boards, you know, it might be an easy answer. You might have an upper hand compared to somebody else studying for the boards. All right, that's, that's all my role is here. Can help you with the clinical diagnosis and also kind of give you a few things that you don't see every day in your practice. So this is a, a patient with, this is a squamous cell carcinoma, centrally located. There's a cavity. Why is there a cavity? There's a cavity because this tumor outgrows the food supply, right? This grows much faster. I told you, squima, in adenocarcinoma, you can have a small nodule you follow for five years, barely growing, those are the adenocarcinoma. These squamous carcinoma, they don't do that. They grow up really fast. They go really fast locally, and they, they die. There's necrosis in the center. That's why there's a little cavity. There's a lot of necrosis in squamous carcinomas. 
And if they show you a cytology and a squamous carcinoma, it's a fair game for the, uh, for the fellows, all right? First of all, <coughs> when you see pink like that, that's keratinizism. The keratinizism gives you like a pink in the H&E thing. Uh, for the, and then, this is take-home message for you. If, you. if you remember, if you want to remember anything in cytology for squamous carcinoma, they'll have a little, you know, nucleus there, and long cytologic processes there. You see that? It looks like a tadpole, right? That looks like a tadpole. You see that with squamous carcinomas. You don't see that with adenocarcinomas. If they show you a cytology like that, you know, with the, you know, like long, like that, like a, looks like a tadpole, like a cytology process like that, that's a, that's a squamous carcinoma. And you can see in the squamous carcinoma, the nucleus, that's a neutrophil right there. See the nucleus? That's a neutrophil. If you don't remember anything, look for something that you can remember. That's a neutrophil. Compare that to that. That nucleus is humongous. Compare that to that. That's small. That's humongous. That's, a, you know, 20 times the size of that. So that has to be malignant. When the nucleus is very large, it has to be malignant. Look at the contours, irregular contour of the nucleus. Dark. Look at that. So this is malignant cytology. That one, I'm not sure with the benign or malignant squamous cell. But that, those cells, those cells, those cells, those are malignant cells. So if you don't remember anything, just compare it to the ones in the background. And then there's really ugly looking cells with cytoplasmic processes, pink looking things. Look, pick a, you know, squamous cell carcinoma. This is a squamous cell carcinoma. And, uh, you know, this is forming keratin pearl there. And uh, I'll show you intercellular bridging. See, this is like a steps, like there are steps right there between the cells. Those are desmosomes. Those are called intercellular breathing, intercellular breezes. Those are desmosomes. You see in squamous cell carcinomas. If they ever show you a slide like that, and you see something like that, you think of squamous cell carcinoma. You don't need markers. All right? You see that, you know, they're talking about squamous cell carcinoma. They may not ask you what's this. They might show you this picture and ask for smoking history or, you know, blah, 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 you know? And you know, this on person time, these people are smokers. So uh, several markers, uh, you know, we, you know, uh, Ketuda and Optivo is not small cell carcinoma. We'll be routinely doing it. We send it out. So, uh, you know, you, we need to know whether this patient has a patient is surgical candidate or not. You know, if you're going to have surgery and take it out, then, you know, no need to ask for uh, PDL one right? <laughs> but, you know, if the patient has metastatic disease, so forth, yeah, of course you need a PDL one So these are some of the markers involved with uh, the uh, cell carcinoma. So let's stop there.